Uh, thank you very much, and, uh, and thank you to UNDP for uh, organizing this and, and inviting me, uh, the, um, particularly um, relevant subject. Uh, and uh, yes, indeed, I agree, democracy is a marathon, uh, and we're extremely tired. Uh, we've been running for a very long time, uh, so it's a, it, 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 it is a um, uh, talking about accountability in Egypt this week is, shall we say, challenging. Uh, in in that it is indeed the buzzword. Uh, most of you have probably been following what's happening, uh, and um, uh, well, the silver lining. The, the, if we take the, the glass half full approach is that for the first time we have people on the street uh, demanding accountability really where the single issue uh, on the agenda is the rejection of attempts to uh, abolish accountability uh, of, uh, of decision makers. Uh, let me try to um, use the limited time we have to share just a few observations around the three guiding questions uh, presented to us by the chair. Um, obviously, these observations are primarily informed by the experience of the last two years, um, but also um, go even beyond that uh, in terms of going back um, uh, in, in the last few years. What, if if I'm asked the question of, you know, what does civil society need the most in order to effectively exercise um, uh, or engage in a process of social accountability, uh, the last two years have taught us an incredibly important lesson, which is for accountability to happen, we need the infrastructure for accountability. It is not enough to just have um, regular or not so regular access to those that exercise decision making. It is not enough to uh, win the occasional court case and reverse one government policy or prevent a disastrous law from um, uh, going into force uh, or um, um, win a victory for an individual, a group of individuals, or a community. For accountability to really be institutionalized, to be really be sustainable, uh, we need to build the infrastructure for accountability so that with any change of government, with any change of parliamentary majority, um, you know, the, the system is there to ensure accountability. When I talk of infrastructure, I mean, obviously, um, Colleagues in the room would be familiar with the package, um, uh, you know, a, 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 not just a right to information law, but a regime for using a right to information law, um, a legal framework that is enabling to freedom of association, different forms of groupings and, and associating around uh, rights, um, a, a complete system, a complete regime of um, uh, not just uh, anti-corruption measures, but corruption prevention measures from public disclosure of assets to rules preventing conflict of interests to, uh, of course, um, a system of budget-making process. Um, we need an independent judiciary, uh, and, and uh, again, we this week we feel how important this is more than ever. More than ever. And finally, probably not usually uh, discussed as part of this infrastructure is the freedom to protest. Uh, the right to protest government decisions because let's face it, right now in this country, in this region, in this moment in history, it doesn't matter how open, how transparent, how democratic the government is, there are going to be protests and those who are here representing governments should go home with this lesson. Uh, people are going to protest your decisions. You may disagree with them, but we need to protect the right to protest. And the worst thing you can do is to prevent that. Uh, the worst thing you can do to end protest is to crack down on protest because that leads to what? More protests. So uh, in order for um, uh, you know, accountability to really uh, be effective, uh, the outcome of policy making should be contested and we should be able to contest the outcome of even an accountable government, even a participatory decision-making process. Now, of course, um, that applies to 
those making decisions. It applies to civil society. It applies to the donor community. A second point to empower um, uh, civil society is to examine past efforts, examine past failings. Where, what, where did we go wrong? And particularly for the donor community, for international institutions, how did we miscalculate? What did we expect that didn't happen and why didn't it happen? And that should start from the European Union's um, uh, European neighborhood policy and, and association framework of the Euro-Mediterranean to you know, the now more for more or maybe less for less. Uh, it, it should apply to uh, the United States in discussing its new MENA incentive fund. It applies to the United Nations. How did the UPR contribute to Egypt's democratization in 2009-2010? But the, 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 the primary question here in terms of examining um, old formulas is can we still expect regimes to reform them themselves? Um, or was this the, the spoiler um, in the equation? Uh, is it still possible to think that regimes are going to self-initiate or self-morph or, or morph into a more accountable government and introduce um, reforms? Uh, or is you know, revolution, the only way to introduce these kinds of reforms. And finally, of course, there is the lesson that for civil society to, be, to exercise this role, we have learned that there is no moving forward. There is no looking forward without dealing with the past. We have learned this from failings in security sector reform over the past two years. As a result, we have people being killed on the street still today. Um, uh, in fact, I'm leaving this session to go attend a funeral, uh, a public funeral in Tahrir Square of the first protester to be killed by government um, weapons under President Morsi, um, uh, who was killed last week and was declared dead yesterday. Uh, it is because the rules on using force, using firearms in policing demonstrators were never examined, were never revisited, that we still have people getting killed on the streets today. It is because security um, leaders and security officials in this country never um, exercised any effort to uh, revisit um, codes of conduct, rules of engagement, uh, that uh, things have not changed. The same applies to judicial reform. The same applies to foreign policy making, um, uh, access to associations. Because there has not been a, a, a systematic um, examination of the past and accountability and truth-seeking uh, of what happened in the past, uh, we were not able to move forward. And that's why two years after our revolution almost, uh, we are still pretty much uh, 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 raising the same demands and, and uh, not getting uh, results. Um, in terms of entry points, uh, and I will uh, rush through the rest of my points, uh, the challenge, of course, for us right now is to redefine what we mean by civil society. Uh, the, the main actors right now, uh, the main actors that are achieving success, that are challenging governments, and that are organizing effectively are outside the traditional framework of a professionally staffed non-governmental organization. We need to recognize that, um, the, the, that there are new actors uh, and we need to find ways to achieve more complementarity between the role of civil society organizations as we know them and these new actors. What we're doing right now is specifically redefine, re-examine our own role so that we move away from that model of um, research, policy, ad advocacy, and strategic litigation to working directly with social movements and with communities through legal empowerment, through community mobilization, and of course um, developing our own capacity to attract and uh, mobilize volunteers. In terms of constructive engagement, and this is my last point, of course we have realized that Shockingly, power corrupts, <laughs> and new governments have even thinner skin than old established dictatorships. And the primary challenge is to deal with this thin skin syndrome. It's not that civil society does not want to engage 
ruling elites. It's that we want to engage with them, provide constructive policy proposals, but also maintain the ability to publicly criticize them when they go wrong. They don't get this <laughs> for some reason. And so when we talk about civil society engagement, yes, of course, we can invest in long-term partnerships. We um, um, can continue to come forward with proposals. But decision makers need to know that their decisions are still going to be contested. And civil society activists that agree to sit with them, work with them, are still going to defend the right to publicly criticize them if they don't see uh, that the policies are going in the right direction. And the second point, this, in, in addition to the thin skin syndrome, is that we have learned that access does not equal influence. Again, it sounds very um, 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 it, it doesn't sound uh, very intelligent or very new, but we have realized that you know we can be able to reach ministers, government ministers on their cell phones, uh, and we can have government ministers or presidential advisors on their Blackberries or iPhones replying to our emails. That was never the case under Mubarak. Now this is new, but that access does not necessarily translate into transparent sharing of information and does not necessarily translate uh, or automatically translate into having an influence on government policy making. Um, I know that there will be a discussion on media later today. Uh, I'm sorry that I, will be, I won't be able to stay, um, but I just want to say as a last point that media is our lifeline. So if you fail on anything else, defend and invest in independent media because that's the only way that we can have any future, any viable future um, opposition uh, or ability to really hold those in power accountable. Thank you very much.